Well, well, well. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 93 of the Titan Forge podcast. I'm Dratnos, joined by Trell. Howdy. Howdy. And uh, Tettles as well. Yeah, g- congratulations on getting the number correct, Dratnos. I d- dude, I wasn't even going to say anything about it, but uh-huh. okay. It's only cool if you don't mention it. Uh huh. Um, how has your. So you'll notice we're doing this show on a Sunday. Normally we do them on Saturdays, starting again next show, and we will keep doing them on Saturdays until the next time we move our schedule for some until reason or other. the next time the Racer World First comes around, and then we have to take some weeks off, and then we figure something else out. <laughs> yeah, that's probably the next, uh, the next thing on the schedule that will impact us uh, whenever that ends up being, so, you know, early next year or something. Um, no idea at this point. Actually, do you guys have a take on... I saw a JB tweet earlier that was like, they need to give us a month in a, a month's notice in advance before the patch comes out, which at this point would mean like July patch. He he does yeah. he is aware that we basically get two weeks to notice every fucking patch always only two weeks to notice by the way, and the funny thing is is I guess this is a little bit of insight into the world of how everything works. The people who are doing the race to world first a lot of the times also don't fucking know until it's announced. <laughs> You're just like, well, okay, I guess we're I guess we're just gonna go. The sick part is these guilds, like uh, like Echo and Limit or whatever, have people they talk to in Blizzard that they like that tell them no- dates, but they're just made up half the time. <laughs> That's what you're at not, least I don't think they're made up. <laughs> I just don't think that if if you all, listen to and, right. they've they've talked about these on stream before where like Basically, they just get a date, and they, you know, they're, and it ends up being wrong half half the time. Uh, but at this time, this time everybody's playing it pretty close to the chest. So if anybody actually knows when this patch is coming out, they're not saying. Um, I hope though that it is soon, and that they tell us when it is oh, soon man. as well. We're all so bored. Just give us the patch. <laughs> well, dude. Okay, so I mean, there was that there was that Chinese leak that had the date at like the patch is coming out at the end of the month and like mythic raid on the 13th or some shit. And I sit there and I look at that and I'm like, how the fuck? Like, I don't understand how they would even like push it that fast because that's what other people are speculating too, that those dates are correct. But the, the like mythic plus affix came out this week. How would they even be ready to go? (laughs) So there, there is that kind of worry of like, has everything been sufficiently tested, particularly given the PTR environment where for the entirety of the raid testing that's happened so far, conduits and the new soul binds and everything were pretty, pretty horribly bricked. You could like create a character and then up until like the first raid testing, you could unlock the new soul bind traits. And then between that raid testing and the last raid testing, you could not do that anymore. And so you couldn't actually like do new soul binds or pick a new covenant or anything. Now that functionality does exist on PTR. They've added a renowned vendor or whatever, but it's it doesn't look like there's going to be more raid testing, right? So, like, I don't know. Um, there's a lot of potentially under-tested stuff there, not just the raid fights, but, like, the systems that they just didn't let us test during, the, uh, during all the testing. And then there's this new affix, which is going to be, by the way, the main top of our, topic of our show, the tormented affix. Uh, it does uh, look pretty surprise. sweet. Yeah. But it's also, you know, how will there be enough time to test, iterate, <laughs> and then, you know, make a release candidate build? Like, they're running out of days to do that at this point. I mean, I think that those, like, days probably were their their goal at some point. Like, are, are those dates actually going to happen? I, I... Yeah, and this has been the thing Maybe. where it's like, perhaps the, perhaps the dates that have been, like, told to limit an echo or whatever in the past have been planned dates that were missed right uh and that that sort of thing could potentially happen again so like this leak or whatever that it would be a july 13th raid uh may end up being the kind of thing that gets missed not because it was a bad leak but because the situation has changed um i don't know though i mean we're now more than half a year without new content it's it's getting it's getting pretty long here they gotta they gotta push something out soon it's is crazy. that abnormal? Like I can't. I, can't, I don't even remember like other patch cycles coming off the point one patch. The like new content out of a raid. Let's see. It was like January after a September launch. Oh yeah, for bod for that's... for bod 
and for Nighthold, right? Those were, yes. those were yeah, those yeah. Were late, I guess like it was like August thirtieth launch. So like yeah, basically September. Um, Look at our beautiful Nighthold background as well. Perfectly fitting for the uh, the, <laughs> the discussion here. Yeah, I remember in Legion when I first started playing, it felt like it was almost too fast, which as a new player probably is about accurate at the time for me. But if I were an experienced player at the time, it would have been like perfect, I think, where it was only a couple months into the first patch and then a second raid tier was coming out. I mean, so this five feels... months. That was like f five and a half months is, is the release date on those, which, I mean, it came out like late. No basically, we could just say December because we're also saying September, December, January. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's like like three more months. It's definitely it definitely has hit its lull where you're just yeah. fucking yeah. tired of now, it. Now, to be fair, the Nighthold, the prep for Nighthold experience was not fantastic. The AP grind to 54 was extreme. People people romanticized that era, but it was it was bad. It uh, was beans. You don't. You, you, yeah. And an extra people month to do that would have probably <laughs> made life a lot better for um you know the the mob souls grinding. Um, People who say Legion was like a great expansion, just it was. I mean, it was it was it was, very, it was very good for a lot of it, and it's just like you are effectively omitting like awful parts of it though too. At the same I, same point, there were some bad grinds. There, the legendary acquisition was bad, but there was some greatness in there too. There's a lot of, a lot of great stuff. There was a there was some lightning in a bottle and for sure. I, I think that something about MMOs as well is that like people are willing to put up with dumb grinds if they. Yeah, if the other stuff is good, right? Like that's something that uh, MMO players yeah. are selected for people that don't mind a little bit of grind. I feel like MMO is like asking for a complaining player base, and if the only thing the players are complaining about is the grind, then I think that's a good thing. I think that's the world of like Warcraft the... player base, bro. Well, yeah, <laughs> there, and there's been a lot of discussion about just the uh, hypercritical atmosphere surrounding the the game recently as well, which I do think is. Uh, there are valid complaints on, on both sides, both how, you know, the community oh, sure. has been uh, handling things. And I think also Blizzard has not done themselves a lot of favors with how they interact with the community. Uh, in particular, not like in recent years, but the, there was like a five-year stretch where they, they did uh, kind of not respond ever to feedback. And I think that led a lot of people to, uh, to feel kind of alienated. I, don't know. I just feel like they're a lot of bit. They're a lot of bit better in terms I, yeah, of like responding I, to feedback I, these days. I Even think, if it's the wrong answer, they're better. <laughs> I, I think if you actually look at the events that have happened between 9.0, like between Shadowlands launch and now, like we got what Valor points added into the game, we got Tyrannical nerfed, we got tanks buffed, we got Three most Ian dungeons Hose nerfed. Interviews. Yeah, we, we fucking dev interviews. But, you know, uh, that you yeah. you get those every cycle, right? Like those those we got more than usual, I guess, but that's because yeah, there's more that's time, the point. right? Like the, they're, they're, they I, I think we have. Something. I think Jarnus is right though. We've had like four or five great waves of change since 9.0 came out, and uh, they're definitely on the right track. I would like to see a little bit more personally, but since they've been consistent with it until about two months ago or so, it's been great to see. All right, so it was uh, like, okay, once well, it was like once every couple of weeks, right? Where they were just. Rolling out some good change for either Mythic Plus or Raid. Yeah. Or just PvE in general. And, you know, I think Blizzard gets some hate for fixing problems that they already fixed in 7.2 or in 8.2 or 8.3 or whatever, which is, like, true, right? Like, they, they do keep creating the same problem that they have already created and solved in previous expansions. That is a, uh, a recurring theme, I think, but... You do have to understand that, like, that it's not like they they are blundering by reinventing the wheel, right? Like, people don't just play the same game for sixteen years if it's not getting reinvented every couple of years. I mean, there's an interesting take in chat that says the frustration with Blizzard comes from the amount of own goals they commit, mm. uh, specifically like the AOE cap and conduit energy and stuff like that. How do you feel about that? So I think conduit energy is an interesting one because it's so clearly dumb. But it's also pretty low magnitude, right? Like, Conjured Energy, it doesn't impact that many people. When it does impact us, which it has impacted me, it's like, this is really stupid. I don't know what it's doing here. It's annoying. But, like, the whether or not a system like Conjured Energy exists, it's, it is a very minor road, blunt, road bump, right? Um, yeah. It's, the only reason people talk about it is because it's, it's the thing where it's like, this is the most obvious one that is clearly bad, that is doing nothing good, right? 
this is the one where every, the most people are going to agree with me, right? Only the, the most contrarian people have these pro conduit energy takes. Um, yeah. but the stuff like the AOE cap. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. That's, that's really bad. That, that is a huge mistake with the, with the game. Uh, my recent pet theory has been that it's based on on wanting to recapture the things about classic that made uh, that were making people so excited about classic during the Shadowlands dev cycle, <laughs> and so they just went back through and were like, "What parts of this should we add?" Oh yeah, we need to make sure that uh, all mage specs are casting frostbolt, right? Like that that should be an ability that all mage specs get. You shouldn't just spec fire and lose the frostbolt ability, you know, just like yeah. classic, right? Uh, and also, only mages should be able to do AOE like classic. Um, and I don't know. I think that was done. I mean, they certainly have to balance some some level of like. How, how do I even describe it? They have to. They they certainly have to balance some level of like MMO, to some level of like end game content. So like or some like there have to be RPG elements of every game, right? And sometimes it feels like yes, they want these classes to be melee specialists so they can role play and like really feel like like cleave specialists. But that doesn't functionally work, and I under—I I think I do understand where they're coming from. But at the same time, they do have to—they kind of have to like figure out that the game is largely end-game focused, and we're moving into like a meta of video games where information is very plentiful. Players want to be just like the absolute best. There's a lot of information that goes around, and there are right and wrong decisions now. Um, whether or not people take those right and wrong decisions that almost like varies depending on your level of play but at the same time i i would say in mass most people do care that their class can't hit more than five targets i think you could look at classic versus vanilla as an example of this as well like how many people were mage solo dungeon farming 15 years ago right versus how many people do it today it is a, versus a lot right it, it's a case of like it's not you can't just import the rules from vanilla and get us to, to play like it was 15 years ago, right? That doesn't that doesn't work. Um, and I think that also the the fact that they are they have this kind of obsession with the RPG elements being relevant to the actual end game doesn't just do a disservice to the end game. It does a disservice for the RPG elements as well, right? Like look at all of these kind of tortured systems they have to make, like conduit energy, like letting us swap conduits, all because they are so married to this idea of your conduit being a power choice, but that ends up making it actually not an RPG choice, right? Like how, how many, yeah. how many players, like if you care even a little bit about your performance and you're playing a balance druid or whatever, right? You were playing night Fae this patch and, and you know, it, it, it removed that element of an RPG choice that could have been there. So I, I certainly do think that there are some things that they hit the, hit the nail on the head with. Like, I think that one of, the, one of the biggest things is that the feel of just being a part of the Covenant, it feels really good to be a part of your Covenant, but you actually don't have a decision. Like, you, like and it depends. Running, right? around like... your, running around your Covenant Hall, you feel kind of like a Venthyr, but at the same time, if you swapped to something that was bad, you wouldn't. You would just feel bad about being the wrong covenant. You wouldn't actually feel like you're whatever, right? I, so I, I play several different yeah. characters, and I, I definitely get this more than more on some characters than others because, like, on some of them it's the covenant I would have wanted to play anyways, right? And on some of them it's like, well, I have to, I have to select this because this ability does the most, and like, I don't like how it looks or how it plays or how it feels or anything like that. But I'm, you know. I'm playing this character for raid or whatever. I gotta, I gotta do it. Well, it's I'm just not... it's so hard to even swap to another covenant for even the people that would set the example in the first place. Because like all the high end players, they can barely even test on PTR until they actually just add the option recently. I think to change covenants mm -hmm. finally. But like, but before then, you had to have several characters just to have several covenants available to test the new traits. And so it's it's kind of like a guessing game. And so everyone's gonna migrate to one covenant over the other more so than if they could have tested them properly. I think that yeah. like class halls was probably their best iteration of this this shit that they have right now. I thought that class halls were actually a pretty big success. I I think the class think the so legion too. class design yeah that was that was sweet like class was specific sick. quest lines and everything and and that was a great part of classic as well was that like the experience of being a warrior versus being a shaman was like you had just these different struggles uh, with the the different classes right like 
one of them's got to go and do all these quests to get their totems and yeah you know you have all these different things and oh if you're a warlock or a paladin you have these epic quest chains to get your mounts and you know if you're a druid oh you got flight form at 68 and uh you save all this gold right and like it's so mm -hmm. cool um and i think that was that was a great element of classic that legion had as well that i think would be good to you know look into more because the class choice is not is is i think a great resonating one but the covenant choice i don't know i think it, it the fact that they tried to make it do both the end game you know arpg bit and the mmo bit at the same time means that it doesn't do great either particularly well they've done this weird thing where they move away from your class identity but that i hope that they there, there is a good balance to be reached i actually don't think that the game is in a bad state right now at least in terms of like the decisions you have to make i think i think it's like okay um it's certain it certainly could be worse right there there are more impactful things that could have ha could have occurred but we'll see we'll see where it lands i think that right now the game is in an is a fine spot but it is kind of stale it's just been too long yeah, yeah. i mean that's i agree too that is the main issue right like that ultimately it, it is not a bad expansion and, and it would be fun if we were doing a new raid and doing yeah. new affix but we're not which is the big problem um Before i don't know we move on, though, I I wanted to mention something on um, something we talked about earlier. It was uh, like, how does Blizzard design all these problems for them to fix themselves? You know, like they give themselves too much work almost. It's like, we, like what we were saying. But I think they have these visions for these systems where they can balance them. But they make it so hard for themselves to balance them that they can never achieve their goal. Like the target cap situation. I think is it's in theory an okay thing. Like every class and spec has this niche environment, niche environment where they can excel. But that really ends up being like, one or two specs are really good at either single target or AOE, you know, not, not all 36 specs have their own niche. And it's just like impossible work they generate for themselves, especially when they have multiple systems like that. Yeah. I, I do. I, I definitely empathize with people that are frustrated because they see how great Shadowlands could be with like a couple of very small changes, right? Like, you've got all this beautiful world design. You've got these incredible raid bosses. You've got these actually pretty cool dungeons. And then you just have these systems of, like, tank weakness, AoE cap, uh, covenant locking, all, all this stuff that uh, is taking what could be an A+, and bringing it to, like, a B or whatever. Uh, and that is... De I definitely empathize with that, you know, frustration. Um, okay, let's talk about something that... There's also some frustrations around, but I think is it was a very positive thing. The great push. Um, this was this happened oh, yeah, last was weekend. Great. This is why we were we didn't do a show last weekend. Tettles and I were, were busy casting this thing, and I think most people were probably busy watching it. That are uh, a lot of our audience, I think, uh, was pretty into this from the conversations. Uh, I saw. A lot of a lot of people were watching. I think the numbers it was over forty thousand concurrent viewers for basically the whole thing. I mean, so that's I would I would classify that as a pretty big success. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. I I was like, I haven't watched the MDI this religiously in a while. I watched the Great Push like I watched the MDI for the very first time. It was really fun to watch the the first of what we hope will be a, a static system that they have. And I think tons of people that have pushed on live maybe even years ago and don't play Mythic Plus anymore probably tuned in just like I did, even though it's only been a couple months for me. Right. I mean, you've competed in the MDI last expansion, right? So like, mm -hmm. you're you know you would watch the the, the fact that you're less in the, invested in like watching the mdi but this part still has a big appeal to you is i think uh definitely something good about about this format of course it was oh, yeah. a new thing too and that uh draw, draws a lot of attention right the first mdi had a bunch of attention because it was a new thing uh also but i thought this format was really 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 sweet um there was a lot of a lot of good stuff about it it did also have the benefit of being on twitch uh, which was due to it not being part of the main MDI thing, right? Being a one-off event. Yeah. So, I'm not going to yeah. lie, that was a pretty big positive thing for a lot of people, I think. Yeah. Twitch is like the home base for gamers. I yeah. think, well, simultaneous running, and you you basically had the opportunity to watch and listen to your favorite teams, like comms, and like watch them while they're playing. Basically, everybody was streaming except for Sheesh. Um, but like even then, that I thought that that part was super cool. Yeah, I, I, I think that that is another big strength of this format was that it it does like i, I don't know i mean it kind of fits with just people like it, it's pretty it pretty much mirrors the high key 
content on Twitch already, right? Except there's less downtime where you're going and running a 23 Sanguine Depths or whatever because it's a key that's in somebody's bags that you've got to upgrade. Um, mm -hmm. But so it's, it's basically just pure, you know, distilled high key pushing uh, that people are streaming. That, that's the content people stream already, and uh, and they got to continue streaming it during this as well, which I think was again just fantastic. So uh, I'm a huge, huge fan of of the format. I hope that they find ways to use this again as much as as much as possible. Uh, I think this thing was was a blast. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's my take. I thought I thought it was just is is really 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 good. I, th I thought it yeah. was really cool as well. I, I think for a lot of the reasons, I, I felt like they kind of captured the essence of what key pushing really feels like, even though it was 15 hours for six dungeons. I remember probably we were going to talk about that in a second, but even though it was 15 hours for six dungeons, uh, it, it felt like the essence of the high key pushing was really there. We also had the luxury of watching multiple world first keys happen like on broadcast, which... I feel like it's a pretty big deal. Like that, that it, it, they started at 24. The keys didn't drop. It was 15 hours for six dungeons, which after the first day, I thought that 15 hours for six dungeons, I was like, holy shit, this is going to be brutal. But you didn't get these teams gridlocked into these like dog shit progression keys where it's, oh, they 28 Halls of Atonement is probably doable. 26 Sanguine Depths is probably doable if you spend six hours doing it. But right. like, I think we got incredibly lucky, actually, with the amount of time and the key starting level that the day the, the day three ended with, like, some of the really hard keys done, but it wasn't like we were just at that point where every key was a 10-hour progression key uh, that was left over, and, and you just saw teams bashing their head into the wall. Like, I think, I think that, was, uh, that was really lucky. I think we also got really lucky that of our six teams, four of them were in the middle of runs where if they had won them... If yeah. they finished them and the other teams hadn't all, you know, done theirs, each of those four teams could have still won the tournament when the timer stopped on the last day. That is yeah, crazy. That's, awesome. that's crazy lucky on our end. Um, I thought the proving, I thought the proving ground was also like pretty solid for what it was. So I, I, the proving ground is brutal for the competitors. Forty-eight hours to just play for six, like fifteen hours a fucking day is awful for the competitors. But at the same time, I, I do think that we ended up getting six very high quality teams and like even yep like okay so yep was at a pretty big disadvantage because they hadn't played together for like the full expansion but even them they were they like put put up some really compelling runs and they were doing fucking 26s and shit and you're just like huh this team is also just super solid even though like i bet if you gave them 30 hours they probably wouldn't have been able to like string together very like competitive times with the rest of the teams. It just kind of came down to synergy. I thought the proving ground format for deciding what six teams to field was like, I, I thought it did really do a good job of um, separating those teams out. You know, having said that, I think that ties into a, a comment we had in chat just now where we were saying a couple of years ago, it'd be boring to watch players do this on live, you know, for all day trying to push one key to the next key level and failing all day long, you know, but I think the, the Blizzard team really nailed this format. Like this is the greatest way to show how life keys can be done in a in a manner where you're still seeing progress and it's not completely static the entire day. I have and an I think the... Is it is it compelling if you see it multiple times a season? I think so. Yeah, like that might be the only drawback if that's not compelling. But by the way, I think the 15 hours was a really good amount for the event. I think you could throw like slight rules changes or do different sets of dungeons for different uh, events or stuff uh, into it to potentially keep it, you know, exciting. But I think that, I don't know, I mean, we run the MDI Cups four times per season, right? I think that this would be better at, at I, I think it could be really exciting or at least like pretty exciting, pretty good. Uh, and I think that that would do be a better outcome than the MDI Cups, which... Uh, are are cool to cast, but I think that they fall off a lot more than this format because there's a lot less variance in terms of who could win any given match, wow. right? We saw some really yeah. close MDI this season. Like, in the MDI Cups, there were some very close runs and some upsets, actually, in terms of, like, lower-seeded teams defeating upper-seeded teams. Nobody but, talked about them. 
But it was still a, a well, I mean, it's still a Herculean effort, right? Like if you're paired up against yeah. Echo in a best a best of three speed run plus eighteen format, you know, like you, you're gonna win that like what one out of twenty times or something like that. If you're if you're close to as good as them, if you're one of those other top few teams, uh, you're you've got maybe slightly better odds than that. But it's not it's not great. Whereas if you're in a great push against Echo, like they could just have a couple bad twenty fives. And they, you know, they could have a bad day or whatever, and and bang, you know, you're vibing. Uh, I think that I, if you ran this exact tournament with these six teams, if you ran this tournament like five times, you would have at least three different winners. I think there's because, certainly format changes to the MDI that could be better. I think the simultaneous running thing is, like, I thought that that was pretty solid as a whole. I, I felt like that was a hit, um, but I, I don't, I don't know what exactly needs to be changed for. MDI specifically, because I, I do think that there is, I feel like if you had this like a bunch of times, if it replaced the main MDI format, I think it would run into some problems because of just the same issues that normal MDI has where it's like too super stale, but we'll see. How'd you guys feel about casting this event versus casting MDI? This is my preferred casting style. I'll be honest. I, I'm much, I'm much better at casting, uh, race to world first like great push style shit where we're just kind of <laughs> sitting there trash talking doing like not a lot of like super rigid play-by-play -play. um much prefer this style honestly and i know there's not a lot of downtime for the great push and that's a, that's a big difference from mdi right it's more yeah. chill it looked like you guys were just kind of hanging out just like you like the the to me, it almost looked like a copy of the event you did last season in season four of BFA, where you just casted a bunch of people pushing keys. Like that was pretty sweet to see. That was a sweet event, yeah. Uh, and I think that similar positives existed for both. Um, so I'm honored that you that you draw a comparison there. Um, it was definitely. I think there's a lot of good stuff there, and casting it was fun. It was. It is definitely different than MDI casting, but. It was actually, it was like halfway between MDI casting and Race to World First casting for me. Yeah, that's kind of cool. I, I like the narrative. I, I mean, the biggest thing with like uh, Race to World First and, and and like the Great Push, which is different than MDI, is like there's a lot of narrative building that you can do. And there's a lot of just uh, time that you can fill with, oh, how is X team's points faring against Y team's points? It's like the same as like the Race to World First, where it's like, how is X team strategy differing here? Or like, wh how would X guild come back into the into the mix really you can't even do that as much in race to world first casting as well because you're mostly just hot following the one guild right like you can you you get these like sporadic updates where it's like oh we just heard this guild had like a 30 percent wipe or whatever or like oh here okay i've looked up the comps here's the comp difference the between these guilds. To, yeah we don't have the licenses to, like, but exactly watch them a lot of the time yeah no no streams are like watching the competitor guilds or whatever you can't that you're not putting both up i think you can you, they, they had deals to like show each other's kill vods um this last time which was cool but it's not it's not like this was where you actually had the you know of the six teams you could have whichever you wanted on the on the live stream at the same at any time dude if if somehow there could be a deal that was there would have to be probably millions of dollars if there was a deal where all of the guilds were together there for would have to be world some first of, yeah for race world first yeah i think that the, mo the more likely thing would be something like echo and limit having like a an agreement where they got to you know, show each other's live feeds on each other's streams for some percentage so, of their broadcast. For yeah, 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 for some percentage or like certain minutes of the day or some shit, right? I, I don't think that would be unreasonable, I, and I I think that uh, Echo and and Limit are, you know, uh, on the kind of terms where they could have that discussion in a way that uh, Limited Method could not back in the day. It's it's interesting that they have reached the the point where the Echo and the Limit guys are kind of friends or at least friendly i mean there's right? always been friendships and like rivalries and, and you know some tensions between certain players in the guilds but the you know the the core ability of the two orgs to like actually come to an understanding has is definitely higher now than it was uh, before more money in the scene is better for everybody i'll be honest with you i think that a better broadcast product as well is is good for everybody but it is tough to come up with a deal that is good for everybody involved right like most things are most things are going to sound like hey do you want to give away some of your stuff for free which most people are going to be like i don't know about that no yeah. no I don't. <laughs> um okay <laughs> we we strained a little bit of field from the uh the great push discussion <laughs> i do think one thing that we should talk about uh is the plague borer thing 
because this is oh, yeah. this has been a huge source of discussion. Uh, obviously, now it's it's been more than a week, but it's still something that I think is is worth getting our our takes out here on. Um, so it, you know, just a disclaimer: Tettles and I, and I are talking about this as individuals, uh, not you know not representative in any way here. <laughs> we're we're contracted employees. Uh, we're contracted people. We're not employees of Blizzard Entertainment. Yeah, we are talking about this as individuals. Please let that be very 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 clear. So that being said, let's describe what happened in uh, The Great Push, which, spoiler alert, uh, if you don't want to be spoiled for The Great Push, I don't, I don't know how you would care about this a week later if you haven't already seen it, but now there's your warning. <laughs> <It's sport. laughs> like, the, the fucking Super Bowl happened last weekend. Yeah, just, just like, yeah, well. <laughs> think of Echo as Snape and think of all the other teams as Dumbledore. Um, <laughs> that's, that's more of a spoiler than this is going to be for our show. <laughs> okay. Um... <laughs> That movie came out 15 years ago. Please. <laughs> Those movies are literally so old. Stop. <laughs> Dude, my guilt's been watching that while we've been leveling in TBC Classic. We've been guilt watching all the Harry Potter movies. It's been a, a blast. Um, Solid one. That's a okay. good movie. So, let's talk about this. The Plague Borer strategy uh, used by Echo involved snapping Plague Borers with a hunter to wherever the rest of the group is, uh, which... The snapping technology is something that has been allowed, right, basically forever. But the part that was uh, was less, I guess, known and much more controversial, particularly among, you know, M plus M plusers uh, who followed this sort of thing, was the exact mechanics of how they made this work, which is a, a misdirection bug that yeah. was being used here. So here's how this bug correction bug. Yeah. Here's how this bug functions. If as a hunter in a dungeon, you cast misdirection on somebody and then cancel it, and actually this works in raid too. Um, so if you want, you know, permanent misdirection so that your hunter stops getting I think it's on fixed you. already. I think it's already fixed. Okay, well it worked the day after this when we tested it in raid. Um, yeah. <laughs> so this was just kind of in any instance content, your hunter could cast misdirection on somebody and then cancel it. And then for the remainder of that instance, that misdirection effect would apply permanently. So all threat that the hunter generated would be given to that other person. So they used this to have Frag misdirect now, cancel the misdirection, and then stand on those stairs for the rest of the dungeon, shoot Plague Borers, uh, feign death sometimes, although I don't think that was even always necessary. I think that was just to stop them from casting on him and killing him. Uh, yeah. And then they would teleport over to now and the rest of the group and uh, kill whatever stuff they were currently working on from really far for really huge amounts of damage. Um, Echo also used a strategy of two tanks to just help manage things, particularly because when the plague borers snap, they evade for a couple seconds on the other end, so you can't actually manage them with taunts or anything like that. Doesn't work. Yeah, it their was second tank was a, yeah. was a guardian druid. It basically like the the utility player, like healing the group, tanking for the group, and in, in situations where they needed. It's really it's really a versatile role to be able to second tank as a Guardian Druid. Also, I wanted to explain something about the playing bo Plague Borers and snapping. So, uh, the bug is what allowed Frag to be like miles away from the group and still snap them. But if you notice, he actually joined the group for like the middle of the dungeon when the Plague Borers were too close to now because they wouldn't be able to snap. They were they had a path available. So, in order to snap anything in World of Warcraft, it has to physically not be able to find a way to walk to the player that it's trying to go to. And so then it'll teleport and evade for a few seconds. Yeah, um, and snapping has been a, a feature of M plus strategies that has kind of been broadly accepted as allowed and like explicitly allowed, in fact, in MDI uh, during dungeons like Ataldazar and even this expansion in Necrotic Wake. There's a huge snap strategy involving the Necropolis, um, yeah. snapping it all down. And that is both allowed and also something that players look at and are like, how is that allowed? You know, how are they bugging this game that I'm watching on, on my YouTube.com slash Warcraft <laughs> or whatever? Um, you know, how, the, 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 the grumble. Um, okay, so so for the perspective of Mythic Plus players, generally things that work inside the dungeons that are e easily repl replicatable and a byproduct of how the dungeon functions is widely accepted and used, right? That's why that Flesh Crafter MC, you didn't see people like, okay, the Flesh Crafter MC being able to skip RP, that is certainly a bug. Um, and it is certainly a bug that probably will be fixed at some point, right? Well, because it, it allows you to, it allows you to keep a, a, 
a flesh crafter for forever and like I don't know, it's like when, the when there's no enemies life. left then the next wave spawns i don't even think it's clear that that's like a bug maybe it's not intended behavior but i think that's a very different thing than like bugs and dungeons with... yeah that one's somewhere in the middle all right yeah where it's like I, I actually don't know for sure if blizzard would fix it if they had a button they could press that fixed it i i think they yeah. probably would but maybe they just want to make sure that if a death knight mind controls one of those undead they don't just get stuck there thinking why isn't the next gauntlet wave spawning you know all right what about what about bugging out uh, Marth. like we saw dorky's yes. group do that shit during uh, so time oh, yeah. okay. this is a great a great point uh the the bear squad who qualified for this tournament using a bug that made a boss not do mechanics right um which is they flew a marth from his spawn platform over the edge they had their their tank get gripped over the edge and a marth resets if he crosses the threshold where you normally walk into his room but he doesn't reset if he flies down over that edge uh and so then they <laughs> fought him out out of his arena and he doesn't do some of his mechanics uh and it, it made it a lot easier uh and that sort of thing is also i would say in a in a big question mark zone um well the problem with that one is they literally had that in several mdi straight and bfa with machimba bugging out on purpose and right. keeping it from using ability and that bug is is a really cool one too. So Machimba in King's Rest, if you right clicked on the appropriate coffin within about two seconds of the person being imprisoned, they would jump. They would jump out as intended, but then Machimba would stop doing mechanics for the rest of the full. And there is another yeah. interesting point, which I think that one should never be actionable because that's just what you're supposed to do anyways, right? Yeah. Like literally yes. just by playing the mechanic good, right. that's true. breaking your friend out of their coffin as quickly as possible is what you're supposed to do. And it happens to bug the boss if you do it particularly well. But like, I, I think that that one is, is a lot different than boss bugs that arise from you doing something that you would never do intentionally, right? Um, I think except the for the fact thing... there's a bug. And I think the biggest thing, and the reason that there's at least some pushback from the Mythic Plus community itself, is because this wasn't a bug with the dungeons. I think if the play if the plague borers were actually just global combating people and like would snap to them across the map, like it was originally. That's what um, we thought it was for the first yeah, like exactly. couple like, hours there. Yeah. Exactly. If if they were global combating the group and then they were just being feigned death off and then immediately snapping away, you know what? That's like fair play because that's a mechanic of the dungeon. It's probably not intended. It's probably like due to poor coding. Blizzard devs or... would not have liked to look at that and been like, "Ah, yes, that's how I imagine plague plague fall would be done." Exactly. No, nobody would have liked to be like, "Damn, that's how plague fall should be." But at the same time, if the, if the plague boards are global combating and then snapping to people, that is reasonable for teams to be able to just like feign death and uh, snap them across the map. Uh, the problem lies within the fact that they were abusing a permanent misdirection bug and then snapping the plague boards with that permanent MD because. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to do something like that. And it's not that every comp or like it, it can be weird interactions with abilities that allow you to snap or do whatever. It's whenever you have to go out of your way to make an ability work in a very specific way that's clearly not fucking intended. That's where you start to run into problems. Yeah. Now, the thing is that none of this is enumerated anywhere in Blizzard rules, right? There's no description of like what are the kind of bugs or unintended behavior that we these will are, accept and what are the ones are that we won't? These are mythic plus, like, right. bylines where you're just like, don't go out of bounds. Don't fly, hack. Yeah. Don't do weird <laughs> shit. Yeah. I mean, hacking in general, yeah, of course. That, that yeah. is pretty clear on the other side of the line. But the fact that we're kind of at this point where there is this sort of accepted set of things you can do any unintended dungeon behavior basically seems to be allowed. But maybe we need to have a, a carve out that says, you know, making your class bug out in some way is different than making the dungeon bug out, right? Or than, than allowing the dungeon to bug out in your favor. I, I agree with that. that. That is like certainly the difference here because even stuff like Shadow of Zul skipping over the wall, right. that it was pr pretty egregious, I must admit, in terms of like how potent bugs are. But that's like... That's one of those things that's like kind of allowed and not even looked down upon. You're just like, wow, that was kind of cool <laughs> because yeah. you can do it. Like you can replicate it. And it's just like, there's not something that's like hidden with fucking misdirection that you need to know before. On the other hand, you know, the told gore cannon strategy, a large part of that was the fact that tricks of the trade functioned for 30 seconds and not for six. Like it said on the that's, tooltip. That's actually very in. true. I forgot about that. Yeah. That's almost like permanent misdirection. It's not. So there's a lot of differences there, right? It's, it's the other line in tricks right it's not the last 30 seconds bit but it's the four six seconds 
just didn't yeah. work. Uh, that that part, but yeah, I mean the ability didn't function like it said on the tooltip uh, yeah. in the cannons. On the other hand, the cannons are part of the dungeon, right? Like that's a way that the the interaction between a class ability and the dungeon is bugged. So I don't know. I mean, uh, it, it's definitely murky. I have I have a I have a good example too. Do you guys remember Radin and that shit with the fucking uh, Grimoire Grimoire Supremacy? Yes, yeah, so, but this is raid. That's a raid thing. Oh, oh, hold on, I, I think I think that there's like a very a very distinct difference here. If Okay, so guilds were abusing Grimoire Supremacy to be able to do infinite, like, not infinite damage, but, like, stupid amounts of damage on bursts with Rod in. Um, they were also getting, like, a lot of meta uptime. It's just because of how the respawn time yeah, around so the boss Yeah, so basically works. you would use your cooldowns and then reset the boss, and the boss had a short enough respawn timer that he would come back while you still had your cooldowns rolling, and they'd also reset. Stuff like that is very, very unintended, but fine. Um... Uh, under, under most circumstances that is like just clever use of game mechanics and very unintended but okay if you're one-shotting a fucking boss with like a trash mechanic or something weird or, or like getting summoned by a warlock so you can come into the raid with a hundred stacks of what, what is that uh, the the last defender and just fucking clock some boss into the ground okay you're getting banned for that <laughs> like there, there's very clear lines of what is okay versus what isn't and it's typically like are you, it I, depends on like how you're using the boss, like whether you're in the instance or not. Right? I would dispute the Grimoire of Supremacy being clear because Limit knew about that and did not do it because they thought they would get banned if they did. So I don't think well, you can say something is clear if uh -huh. a guild thinks that they shouldn't do something because they think they'll get banned and then another guild correctly does it and doesn't get banned, right? Like that, that yeah. th there, there's a lot of different things there, but it's not a clear situation. Um. I, I do think also you that... You know what's not okay. Kind well, but of. I think that's a good example of something that's like always allowed in M+, though, right? Pre-gathering resources before a dungeon starts in any sort of way is basically yeah. always allowed. They were doing this in the Great Push, right? You would activate a soul bind and then activate a different soul bind and you'd get, you'd get to double dip. Uh, uh, Ambition was mind-controlling gargoyles before starting their Halls of Atonement key to preserve 45 seconds of a 10% damage reduction at the start of a key. You know? Uh, that sort of stuff is basically always been allowed in mdi and in, on the tournament realm they don't allow stuff like the ludwig kill to then be able to fight trothak without killing oh, ludwig first but you could do that, that on the live servers and never get in trouble for it uh despite the fact that it's like so clearly exploiting a bug that, that, that one worse. that one would not be allowed for the great push by no the that way. that and that that's the kind of thing where or the temple of sithralis where you did the dungeon backwards also, that was that was a banger that was so Blizzard insane. fixed you had that. Like three rogues, stealth all the way to the end of the dungeon, and then just go backwards. They never. They fixed it, but they never took action against any accounts that did any of that stuff. Raider IO came in and, and voided those the the IO from those runs, but Blizzard never did anything about it, and Blizzard never did anything about uh, any of the you know freehold Trothak. Stuff. Do you think Blizzard.io can like void runs in the same way Raider IO has previously? I don't, yeah, I mean, it, it, so it, that's a good question. Of like. With the implementation of in-game M plus score, should there be something about to, to make sure that if somebody gets three hundred extra points from Temple of Sithralis, being free low on a plus twenty five when every other dungeon is hard on a plus twenty two or whatever it was, uh, is that something they should look into? I don't know. I mean, there are also weeks where, like, I, I remember in Legion, guardians and pets were just fucking bugged and doing six hundred percent times damage. And Beast Mastery, like, the top runs were like. Beast Mastery Hunter, Elemental Shaman, Beast Mastery Hunter. And they would just, like, fucking run straight through a key and just do it on six levels higher than has ever been done. And yeah, I remember you're, that. Your, like, yeah. limitation is tank survivability and shit. Yeah. And you're like, okay? I don't know. I mean, I, I think that it's reasonable for a different set of rules to exist for live versus for tournament realm. Um, yeah. I think that makes... I mean, that just... That makes sense, right? Um, but I do think that they should look into codifying what sorts of bugs will be allowed versus which ones won't because right now the rules just say at our discretion and so there's a bunch of stuff that is like clearly bugs that has been allowed and so it's hard to then look at the echo thing and be like this shouldn't be allowed without doing what we've just done which is an exhaustive analysis of like why is this different than the other things why exactly. should this be allowed uh, and i don't think it's fair it would be fair to just go back and necessarily ban echo for it um without having something in the rules that's like okay here's you know, here's here's our position on this, right? Here is why an infinite MD bug is different than moving a boss to a point where it doesn't do mechanics, which is also something that is, is clearly a bug. 
Um, but, you know, and I think yeah. also it would be reasonable for them to, to ban that kind of thing as well, right? Making it so bosses don't do mechanics uh, is, I think, another thing they could just add to their list of don't do this uh, on Turnit Realm, you know? Unless it's something like Machimbo where it's just doing the right strategy, bugs the boss. Don't do, so, don't do something weird to make the boss do, do no mechanics. <laughs> Somebody was talking about Avatar of Seth Rollins shrouding, and this is yeah. like really off topic. Did you know that you can fucking <laughs> yeah. bug out, um, what's his name, uh, Kael'thas, Sun King Salvation, with fucking shrouds? In. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, no it's way, bad. man. Well, it's not as bad because nothing happens, but you all, like, everybody in the fucking raid who has him targeted immediately detargets him, too, and you're like, what the fuck just happened? Why am I now targeting myself? Because he goes invisible, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that ends. Oh um, yeah, World of Warcraft. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, there's our, I guess, our bit on the play borers. Okay. Um, would you, would you, would you ban Echo Slash? Not ban, but okay. What, what would infraction I, would, would you take any, their cup would away? You reply? Yeah. I think that that is a decision that Blizzard should make based on what exactly is in the chat logs with the admins and uh, you know wh whether they feel like they were lied to by omission or whatever. Um, but I do, th I mean, I, I think that there, it, it is a much more important than what they do in the specific case is coming up with like a good rule so that every team knows what will be and what won't be allowed next time. Cause I think that's the big thing is that, uh, you should be able to predict what, what is going to be allowed and what's not. And it definitely shouldn't depend on how well you explain the bug you're going to use when you're asking for permission. That kind of thing is like, it, it's agree. really bad if we're incentivizing teams to just explain their bugs in a favorable way. Um, yeah. For, for me personally, I think that it's, it's unfortunate that this happened. I hope mm -hmm. it doesn't take away from like the success of the event as a whole. Um, I think that they probably shouldn't get the cup re removed. And it's like, like Dratna said, there just has to be like future, very clear instructions where it's like, we're not gonna, we're not gonna punish you if you bring this bug to us. Like, it's not a big deal. Um, but at the same time, they also shouldn't. There should be a way that, like, also doesn't promote not streaming your practices and shit. too. you have to be very careful with what's going on, um, right? Because like, we we what you don't want to have happen is for teams to have this huge incentive to practice off stream and develop their bugs in secret and then spring them on the admins day of. And if that sort of thing has a much higher success rate at getting to use your bug in the tournament versus like streaming it and then having it get reported and having it get fixed, like we're creating the exact incentives we want to avoid, which is we don't, yeah. we want people to stream their practice and we want the disadvantage from that being that other teams can see you. Right. And like, that is bad enough already. We don't need to add any more negative incentives to stream um, on top of that. So I, I think absolutely whatever policy gets crafted really needs to look at, what incentives are we creating for streaming here? Um, because we, we definitely got to keep those. True. Oh, I was just going to say, I think, I think keeping people streaming is the right play like that. Uh, we also had a chat from Riley actually just now about should teams disclose bugs to each other or should that be mandatory for them to disclose bugs to each other? But I don't think they would disclose like the little things. You know, like there's, there's always like a bunch of little things in this game that don't work properly. And so for one, it's hard to even communicate all that all at once. Mm -hmm. And two, like Dragon was saying, I don't think we would want to discourage streams. I think that a requirement of disclosing major bugs you're going to use to Blizzard and then getting them to, like, okay each of them before the competition starts uh, would probably be a good one. Like that. It could be like a cutoff, like, Wednesday or something. Yeah, I don't even know. Like, Wednesday, even Thursday, whatever. Like, just send, like, making it so that Blizzard says, okay, look, you got to send us. If you're going to use a major bug, right? Like, not just something where it's like, okay, this soul bind is giving extra value or whatever. Uh, yeah. You know, some kind of little minor proc that's being used or, like, something you're swapping before the dungeon starts to get 30 extra verse for the first 30 seconds. Like, okay, we don't care about that stuff. But if you're going to do something, especially that core core strategy-based, I think it's the kind of thing where we, we would want Echo to submit this Plague Bore misdirection thing. We would want uh, Bear Squad to submit the Amarth. Oh. Do you want logs thing. and pods. And yeah I, yeah, I think making making the teams be like, okay, look, we won't tell the other teams about it. We won't fix it before the tournament comes out. But you have to tell us about it, and we have to give you the okay, or else we might, we, we, you know, we'll reserve the right to just DQ you afterwards, or you know, remove that dungeon from your score or whatever. Uh, I think if the you biggest tell us about the it. Biggest, 
the biggest fear is that they're just gonna fucking like fix the bug like day before and shit, right? right. Which which has happened. One one way of looking at this is like okay, Echo plus thirty Plague Fall two chest a week before the tournament where they found the Cyclone mind control thing, right? Blizzard fixed that really fast, and maybe that's a disadvantage to Echo. On the other hand, other teams would have known about it and had time to practice it and also use it, right? It's not like that bug being fixed was actually that big a deal, I think, for Echo, because they they had already given it up by choosing to stream, right? Like, they already did not have a competitive advantage, really, from that. Like, they had a couple extra hours of practice on it, but other teams would have been able to find that practice and uh, figure out the strat, I think. So I, I actually don't think it was that big a deal that that bug got fixed. Um, no, it, it made the tournament a lot better because then it would have turned into Plaguefall pushing simulator. Right, and also they would have had to find a way to make keys go above 30 on the TR, which is actually apparently kind of annoying to do. Oh, really? Yeah. They still capped at 30? There, apparently there's it, it, it's something they would rather not do if they don't have to. <laughs> yeah, the, dust, the dungeons are capped at 30 and... and... Yeah, basically. Dust off the old right. set level 31 <laughs> scroll. That's probably a new item that's got to be invented. Uh, I don't know. There, yeah, it's, it's not going over 30. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm sure they'll do it if they need to, if, if live keys are getting to that level. But yeah. The only time we do like 32s and 31, yeah. 32 and BFA. Keys can level up to like, no, we did it in BFA, right? 31, really? 32. Yeah, but, we did. Like Junkyard, yeah. On Tournament Realm, a scroll to set a key right. to 31 or whatever, I think, doesn't exist and would need to be uh, created and stuff. I don't know. I forgot about that. I mean, okay, yeah. I it wouldn't know. be that I, hard, I don't. I'm I don't sure. see the code. Maybe it's maybe it's harder. Yeah. Than I think. I, I'm pretty sure it's not actually that hard. It's just something where it's like, oh, we actually need to know in advance if we oh, got to do this. We yeah. need this right now, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, that's, uh, that's, I guess, the bit about about great push and plague borers tldr coming up with a cool with a good bug policy uh that makes a lot of sense to the players and to the viewers i think is an important next step to take but all in all it was a great event and uh, a lot of a lot of great teams that all came really close on this thing too so uh great to see okay uh let's move on to tip of the week Let's see, Trell, why don't, why don't you go first? Because I've not written down. Actually, I'll take this one. But You can yoink you that first. one. Yeah, you, bro. <laughs> nice. we, we left one for you. Okay, you, you go first, though. Uh, so we talked about in our Time Force Discord this morning, which we can put a link to as well for anyone new to the show. But we are talking about how to learn a new spec and as a DPS player, like how to quickly learn a spec the correct way. And I think we can do a whole episode on this, so I'm just going to go over one small part of this. But what I found in my experience is to find someone's opener at some point in your process on like a good single target mythic boss and like find one of the top logs in your language. So for me, English, and then study their opener on the casts tab on the timeline tab. And then just look at how they do things. Cause this is like, this is usually the most important part of the spec on how to do the most damage as fast as you can. And usually how to like sequence your cooldowns or when exactly to press the buttons around your cooldowns. If that makes sense. Dude, what I would do when I was playing a spec I was unfamiliar with is I would literally do this and then I would pop open a notepad doc and I would look at this opener and I would just be, I'd write down my keybinds in order for this opener and just put it on one of my other monitors for when I was playing the fight. So I'd just, it'd be like, okay, Fist the White Tiger first, you know, Tiger Palm, Juan, uh, you know, whatever macro or whatever. And then uh, Potion that's a good or idea, something. Yeah. Uh, and then. Yeah, you can see my macro in that opener. Like, that's clearly a macro where, like, I, I pop four things at the same time. Yeah, so I would literally just have this, like, on my on my notepad uh, next to my screen. And I'd actually, I put a little line between each of them or whatever. And then I would always have that to refer to if I ever was, you know, sometimes you just get a little bit lost and uh, that, that would help me for the first like five, 10, however many pulls before I, I felt comfortable with a, an opener. I think, yeah, for, I think exactly. for me, like it's not even just the opener, but I, I think just like a really good understanding of the priority of the abilities like coming into the spec itself is just like the most important thing. And then like the fluidity of like the rotation, eventually you're going to get it by just playing more and more. Um, you can even do things like fucking battlegrounds and like other like really casual content to try to like learn even like the utility keybinds. I find that like doing battlegrounds to learn like the utility shit is normally pretty nice and not, not exactly like super engaging content. So you can kind of just like brain off. Um, but like, 
doing battlegrounds, going in and like hitting a tr training dummy, and like understanding the priority of the rotation first and foremost is the most important thing. And then eventually you'll just get more fluid with it in time. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. I think that a lot of people learn things in different ways. So what works for one person isn't necessarily going to work for you. But I think almost everybody does well with just a bunch of reps on something. So getting some practice, just doing some dungeons or whatever on a spec is really, really valuable. Uh, but making sure that you have yeah, the right, you know, macros set up in advance can be huge for it too. That kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I think, I think when you, and we can do a whole episode on this, like I said, there's so much that goes yeah. into this and all three of us have different ways that we do it. I think that'd be an interesting episode, but, uh, when you first learn to spec, you also swap your keybinds around a lot because at first you'll put them on your bars and you'll be like, oh, well, these five abilities are probably going to be my most spammed abilities. And then once you hit max level or something, you come to find out, oh, I never use this ability ever. Like there's always one or two bloat abilities for classes these days as of Shadowlands. Like Death Coil for Blood Knight, Blood Death Knight, you just never use that. So you just oh, take it off your bars eventually. Blood? It's yeah. basically you. It, the the cases you'd use it are few and far between for sure. You're at range and you need a. You're at range and you need like a heal or some shit. You, you can use it as a heal in Lichborn on yourself, but it's not as good as Death Strike. Or yeah. you can use but, it as range DPS. Yeah. Or you can use it as a heal on Lichborn on yourself, and it's worth using if you don't have a target in melee range to Death Strike, right? But you would yeah. need to have enough runic power to cast it, which is rare that yeah. you have that if you're not in melee range of something to hit. <laughs> oh, so yeah. it's like, uh, it's, it's enough cases that... that I have it on my bars, but I don't press it most of the time. Yeah, exactly. Or like Expel Harm for Mistweaver or a couple other random things like that. Uh, yeah, Corruption for non-affliction warlocks. What is that thing doing back in the game? Hello? It's like a three second cast time for, for Destro and Demo locks. Um, yeah. Definitely, definitely good to, to think about. We will do a whole episode on that, so stay tuned to that soon. I think that's going to be a, that, that's a really good one. Uh, my tip of the week is that Warcraft Logs now has a recruitment tool that you can use to not use WoW Progress, uh, which is good because WoW Progress is not good. WoW Progress is a site from 1960 <laughs> that is still used for World of Warcraft it's recruitment. Yeah. It, 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 at the beginning of the internet, there were great sites such as AOL.com and WoW Progress. <laughs> um, so he, now there's so a, an offering from Warcraft Logs. I haven't used it myself, but if you look at the featured guilds of the day, actually, Might is on here right now. One of our featured guilds, uh, one of one of the Warcraft Logs featured guilds for today. Uh, so, it? yeah, there it is, Might. I mean, if you look at that, they're 10 out of 10 Mythic. Wow. Hey, my, my guild is a featured guild? Yeah, right right there on the Warcraft Logs front page. Uh, what are they looking for? Recruitment. Mage. Yeah, uh, Unholy, oh, Arcane Fire, Frost. Specs. Three well, That sounds about right. Yeah, those are the things <laughs> we're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty cool. And, uh, you know, it's a four-day-per-week raiding guild on Zul'jin Horde. Um, they're one of the top five 12-hour guilds in the world. Wow, congratulations, Settles. We're fucking uh, epic. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's that's so cool. Um, and there's you know all the contact info, um, and you know here's their schedule and everything. And there's oh look, you can see TTV Tettles right in there. Um, so hey, look, UDM is now streaming. There he is. Yeah, and there's I guess they, they, there's the app link. So this is what recruitment looks like on Warcraft Logs. I actually don't know what it looks like if you don't just click on a guild. If you do, do you like get started? This is fucking sick. Yeah, this, this is kind of cool. Oh, geez, it, it, it auto populates what my old main was set as or something and then you put a bunch of stuff in and it'll so yeah already it's 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 looking like a potentially better system than uh than wow progress to use so uh, do look into that if you're in the the market for recruitment or if you're a guild looking for a place that you should have a recruitment profile hopefully there will be an offering from raider io soon as well in this space uh, i know that's something they've been working on for a long time uh, and i think that that will be something that will be really cool whenever it comes out too. But for now, if you want to get away from WoW progress, Warcraft Logs is the place to be. Oh, interestingly enough, you sometimes just have like people's alts and shit show up on like your recent, I, I bet if you run like multiple raids, I bet you're gonna have like 30 characters and shit, right? Yeah, I don't know. here's my, my um, WoW progress panel is like, a huge list of all my alts or whatever, because they've all been in raid at some point or something. Yeah, I mean, or something. Looking, looking at my raid, it says we have seven healers. Certainly mm. don't have seven healers. There's like um, three derp characters on here too for some reason. Oh uh, yes, multi-class melee player. 
Yes, my <laughs> multi or multi class melee player. Mm. Yeah, good a good main alt management system. It's hard to do though, right? Like even though a lot of people have their Warcraft things connected, their Vnet accounts connected is still, I imagine, a challenge. Anyways, a uh, cool new thing to be aware of. Tettles. Let's take a look at your clip of the week, which I forgot to pull up, but I will pull up now. This is a fucking this needs audio. Okay. Bad clip though. Bad clip. <laughs> Is this, wait, is this? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Right. Here, let's let's listen to this clip from uh, oh, no. from the official Warcraft broadcast. Tettles, tettles, there's the town portal scroll. Oh no, no, they're analogy. gonna jump off. They're, they gotta do the fucking. Oh, no, I just said the F word. The whole stream. dungeon. <laughs> they're in trouble here. They're gonna hearth out. No. And they... Man, there is live footage of Tettles losing his job in 4K. <laughs> <laughs> High definition job loss in a blink of an eye. Jesus. Um, I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry that happened to you, Tettles. I'm, there's no, no you're not play. Sorry. Do not say, stop that. <laughs> stop that it's, immediately. It's not even a big deal in reality, though. Is yeah, it? no. it's not. It's not the. Other. I mean, obviously, we try not to swear on the broadcast, but um, everybody has slip ups from time to time. Especially with how that one is presented. Like, okay. It's not me cursing at anybody or at like at competitors or anything like that. It is me just I actually dropped that bomb because they're about to have to run back this twenty five at the end of the day, and I didn't think about what I was saying. It was brave to select this as your clip of the week, though. I I'll give you give you some credit for that one. I don't care. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Dude, my favorite my favorite titles of broadcast oopsie is when the, that time where we were doing like a. a ksm community tournament or something and they they didn't cut your mic going into a break and you were just like this is gonna be a swift 2-0 right <laughs> yeah that was, that was so bad I, I you didn't out. cut my mic that's not my fault <laughs> okay i was i was honestly just speaking the truth it was a swift 2-0 and it was not it was not my fault that i said that they didn't cut my mic yeah that's uh, I, I, I'm extremely paranoid about them doing that but I'm sure that like that's all of us is, you know assume the mic is gonna get cut to our the, downfall sometimes. Oh no, dude, there you weren't around for this, but whenever we were in Columbus, one of our producers, every single like he would be in my ear while we're on the desk sometimes and be like, fuck you, Tettles. And I'm just sitting there like, <laughs> okay, I'm just sitting here like this and just like, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was epic. I actually that that was a that was a fun time. I'm pretty sure Dreadnoughts renamed himself Swift 2.0 in some Discord channels after that event. I didn't yeah, know. I didn't do that. Other people did. I think that oh, was okay. Maybe, maybe that like was... Shift or somebody. I don't um, feel bad. Yeah. I don't feel bad. There's, I being truth. there's the emote Swift 2.0, which is like the Swift Mend icon and a 2.0 written on front of it. That's <laughs> right. I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that got created. In, but I, I wasn't involved in any of that. But it was funny. Okay, um, let's move on to our main topic, which is the new seasonal affix, Tormented, uh, which has been, it's now playable on PTR, and has been for the last couple of days. Um, so here's how the affix works. It is like Awakened, in that there are four mini-bosses throughout the dungeon. Unlike Awakened, you don't go to a special realm to fight them, they're just there, vibing out in the dungeon. Uh, you've got their locations on the mini-map uh, as well. And they just kind of hang out. And then you go and fight them. Each of them has an aura that is active while you're fighting them. And if you don't kill them, the end boss will have that aura instead. And when you kill them, you will get a choice of three anima powers that are locked to that mini boss and that role, maybe for that week. We're not actually sure about that part yet. Um, and we aren't 100% sure that there are only four mini bosses as well. It's possible there will be more that are also weekly, potentially. That's a, so Zyro was uh, was running this theory by me that because there are six wings of Torghast and we have four so far that are each associated with a different wing of Torghast, maybe there are two more that like rotate in Ooh, based on different wings of Torghast. But as of right now, that's unknown. All we know is that there are four so far that we've the seen this reset. A lot of questions will be answered on the next reset on PTR. All, and the reset after because I mean awaken swap every two weeks right it was AABB AABB yeah that's true I forgot about yeah. that that was wild so there, there may be there may be some swapping in in that realm of possibility as well um 
these mobs are like prideful in that they have true sight in that they don't give count and in that they don't reset health on wipe which i think are three smart things to give these things um Agreed. and they give you this the anima powers again which don't have rng associated with them right you can go into a dungeon and know which anima powers each one will offer you based on your role and then you run the dungeon again it will be the same offerings at least uh, for that week at least for that week they might change week to week again we don't we don't know exactly how this affix changes weekly but within a given week it's it's set right it's not there's not an rng component to it um of the four lieutenants there are incinerator arkeloth uh, who is the soul forge the one from the soul forges his aura is basically just the soul forge one which is aoe damage every three seconds uh and then slight fire mechanics a dispellable fire damage taken dot or thing and a fire void zone not particularly challenging one to deal with though uh yeah the main thing on that guy is just his aura it's just a ticking like almost a pride 10 stack is what i saw it compared to okay. so it's not like actually aura. insignificant uh like quite a bit of hps will be needed to get through that on a high key i guess yeah, um, probably. notably if you skip him and if you skip any of these mini bosses they also do apply negative effects to the final boss of the instance right that, that same dude, aura yeah. yeah, and if you skip him, he applies that aura to the final boss. Does um, not seem possible, particularly for most final bosses, to have a, have this aura ticking. Maybe yeah, Halls of Atonement. Right. Maybe. It really depends on the bosses. Um, ah, fuck. I don't think... Maybe maybe Halls? I feel like Devos could... You could play this while in that fight. Maybe. There's no, dude, people play that, that boss right now with zero offensive and zero fucking defensive cooldowns. That, that boss is literally done with nothing. Okay. Yeah, I mean... Okay, so I, I, I think Devos and, and Hall's last boss are the ones. But the thing is, you're not just adding this aura to them. You're also giving up the, um, you're the giving power. up the anima power, right? Which, from particularly if it was early in the dungeon, might have saved more time even than, than it cost to kill this thing. Yeah, the opportunity cost for skipping these is actually a lot higher than anything we've seen in the past. Um, it, there's a lot of shit that is gained. Like, player, it is, it is permanent player power that you were losing, which... right. The, the problem with a lot of these seasonal fixes is that, is that the cost is time at the at the gain of like some potentially temporary thing and sometimes nothing but some temporary thing but now it's permanent player power that you're gaining at least in some element right you could look at like the reward for awakened and the reward for prideful actually and even i guess beguiling gave you a little bit of count then awakened count, gave you yeah. a skip then prideful gave you a pretty big buff for a minute and now you're getting four anima powers for doing the affix. Like the, they have ramped up the reward for doing the seasonal affix over the last four affixes, uh, and this is now very compelling. It's it's to the point where a dungeon might literally be faster if you added this affix to it, right? And you got the chance to kill these things yeah. and get the anima powers. Like maybe, which especially if you can pull them with mobs, which is looking like it's going to be the play for sure. Yeah, uh, and so the the next one, Oros Cold Heart from the Cold Heart place, is a fifty uh, percent reduced move speed aura. Again, that's that's maybe something you can deal with, uh, like last boss Tradova? calls with. Tradova, uh, I think, honestly, can be played with that. As honestly, well. that will make my my group mates kill me much less on that boss uh, with the, those renegade projectile <laughs> things, <laughs> right? Give them the fifty percent reduced movement speed, and I, there's a lot less of those. Dude, yeah, the until someone gets do. a beam. Yeah. It depends on the comp. Like, if if it's Ellie, Shaman, Mage, Moonkin, Holy Paladin, Vengeance, Demon Hunter, okay, none of, like, basically all of those classes are self-sufficient, even with a 50% slow, and they can deal with it. Like, think about fucking Zav. You play mm. that shit with 0% movement speed with that comp, and you can just run around, right? Yeah. Uh, this one does Biting Cold, which is a 10-yard AoE dot that is applied to a player and then anybody else within that AoE, and then a frontal. Um that it's a long enough cast you can dodge it so definitely the kind of thing you could play with that with a, a pull right I, even a medium difficulty pull this doesn't add too much to it um although anti a little bit melee unfriendly this spread mechanic so uh sag uh it's only one person at a time so it's not too bad saga yeah, on the breaker you just go over 50 percent increased fizz damage taken aura holy paladins holy paladins holy paladins uh then Massive Smash is, yeah, physical damage to all players, or to players within 16 yards, so just run away from that. Uh, and Lumbering Might, which makes him fixate and walk slowly, right? Or I guess follows the tank and walks slowly, and then if he hits him, bonk. Yep. 
Um, so oh, I yeah, kinda, that guy's gonna one shot when he yeah. has that buff. Uh, also, potentially something you could do with packs, particularly if you have trees to put him on when he does his his big thing. Uh, but fifty percent increased physical you know damage taken. Trees? trees don't trees don't work on them. They already put yeah. I was gonna say there's no way that trees work on those mobs, right? Okay. All right. They then. used to on Urgroth in season four, but they uh, used some foresight and prevented it this time. That's what I was well, thinking of. Yeah. It it it, it normally just kind of depends. Like typically, like one o like level. I was gonna say one o two, level 62? 62, 62 lieutenant mobs that don't like get taunted by trees. Like all sixty ones get taunted by trees though. And the more I think about this, actually, a 50% increased physical damage taken aura probably makes most packs pretty lethal, huh? So you probably don't actually want to fight yeah. this thing with anything, huh? He's going to be a tough one with packs for sure. But I think on bosses, it's usually okay, because some bosses are primarily magic damage. Oh, yeah, you take this thing into a, I mean, particularly into like a fortified boss. That's actually probably pretty doable. Yeah, um, this not the last like boss, obviously. Moizala, Moizala and uh, last boss, like Nalthor, Moizala, all of those are fucking banned. Like, last boss of Peter so, Payne with Scythe. Now there's actually about two different things magic. here, uh, right? Are, are, are we talking about pulling Sagadon into a boss, or are we talking about oh. pulling the last boss with this aura still active? Oh, I was thinking last boss with the aura. Yeah, if you're pulling him into a boss. I think you could pull him into some bosses, right? Uh, again, you can't pull this into a last boss because then you'll get both the, the last boss will get the aura because it's still alive. Yeah. But I think that maybe you could pull him yeah. into a boss boss, potentially. He looks like he may be pullable into, like, uh, second boss in, in um, Sanguine Depths. Yeah, we'll take a look Marvel. at the, the location. Actually, we can just pull that up now. Uh, so Sanguine Depths here. Yeah, this is S is, is uh, that one. And uh, yeah, you, I, actually, that looks like it's probably right. You probably just walk in and find him, right? You, you could pull him into Vintanax. That'd be really fucking funny, but <laughs> you could. <laughs> I think you probably pull him before Ventanax and get that power for Ventanax. Uh, that seems seems about right. Yeah. I think that's yeah, that's going to be the move. Um, there's oh, there's a couple the that are is? there's a couple that are placed near bosses though. Like the, like the second boss in Necrotic Wake, Amarth has one right next to him, and you can literally just spear Both. that guy yeah. and the boss at the same time and just easily kill it. That's going to be a big move. Um, cause yeah, so there's the last one, Varuth though. That is Varuth, the hardest one, right? Um, which mm -hmm. is 50% healing reduction aura, uh, and then high physical damage to the tank and leaves a bleed. High physical Holy damage to a target God. and nearby targets and leaves a bleed. Holy Paladin, any boppers? Um, but other you than that... Bop, bro? Yeah. Anybody got uh, a sack? Or am I looking to play Mistweaver with zero tank defensives? So yes, uh, who who was it that gave us these images, Trell? Of the different oh, those are our, our, our patron Foden from EU. So shout out Foden. These images are nice. Uh, yeah, so here's where there are spawn locations in the other side. But three of them are on the the ring, and one of them is just in the Mechagon area. In halls, three of them are well, two of them are before the first boss, one of them is before the second boss, and one of them is before the third boss, right? Uh, in mists, two of them are before the first boss, one before the second, one before the third. In spires, it's like, what you could you could do this second one before Ventnax, right? They're all they're kind of front loaded in the dungeons. What I'm getting at here, right? Like most of them, you're getting your second animal power by the first boss. Uh, I guess Necrotic Wake actually being a bit of an exception, but you have weapons there, so. Uh, and then you you know by by like in Sanguine Depths before you pull the second boss, you have all four of your animal powers, right? Um, yeah, that's pretty big. And then Plague Fall. Theater you pain's really interesting. Yeah. When, when you jump down into theater, there's one like right after the first boss in that middle area, and you can either walk past it or pull it right then. And then you can get the other three mini bosses after that, like pretty early on before you really do anything in the dungeon. So I think it's going to be the play to either get three or maybe all four powers as fast as you can, and then then kill all the bosses and try. It. I saw somebody do some weird shit in DOS where they went around the fucking ring and got all the powers like ASAP. You should right? Like it just makes sense that. If you're going to kill them at some point, you should do it early in the dungeon and get the power, and not later in the dungeon and kill a bunch of mobs without the power, uh -oh. right? The alternative is you're going to have to backtrack, like, a that's, decent bit. But... That's not that much of a backtrack in DOS, right? In DOS, you could literally just go around the ring this way and then go to Hakkar. Uh, or maybe... Where can people... Yeah, you just backtrack a little bit and do Mechagon first so that you can get all four of your powers for when you get to Hakkar. Because that's the other thing, right? Prideful yeah. made bosses like Hakkar, like Ventanax, like Executor Tarvald, doable. 
But I think Anima Powers probably will do that as well. If you look at those yeah, bosses, four. you have four Anima Powers for Hakar. You have four Anima Powers for Tarvald. Um, you don't have four for Ventanax, Inspires, or anything, but you have two. Yeah. That's helpful. Well, I think um, in addition to that, they give player power, but they also have, there's a Necrotic one. So you can make Hakar and uh, Nalther much easier by reducing the amount of shield they have. That's so cool. Well, I mean, stuff like that too is you can you can directly tune those affix weeks. Like if you if you made the raging one do fucking stupid amounts of damage, or if you made the the necrotic one do just like stupid amounts of damage, that effectively can tune tyrannical in a certain way because those affixes are only apparent on tyrannical. Well, do we know yet whether these affix anima powers only show up on the weeks of those affix? Um, I don't think. Yeah, I don't know. Because isn't volcanic Last available on PTR volcanic, right now? Volcanic. Yeah. yeah, Volcanic's on there now. But P Volcanic yeah, isn't... Is, is Volcanic the actual natural affix week on the PTR right now? Oh, that's a good question. I, I don't think, think so. so. I don't think it is because either, it but you can get the end power. It weird the live one, right? So it shouldn't be. Sometimes they get desynced, the, the PTR weeks and the live yeah, weeks. Yeah, they though. do get desynced. It's, it's, I actually um, don't know the answer. I, I bet, though, that these... Like, the affixes that are related to... Or the animal powers that are related to affixes aren't just showing up on those weeks, though. I, I bet they're just kind of always potentially in the pool. Well, there's some that relate to, like, the affix itself. Like, sang you have to stand in Sanguine to gain the bonus of Sanguine. No, Sanguine the is... Sanguine. Your healing spells and abilities have a chance to heal allies uh, and uh -oh, deal damage to enemies within 12 yards of you, right? So just a AoE okay. damage proc. It's just a proc, yeah. It completely it's changed from what it was then. Yeah. Same thing with Volcanic. It's just a damage proc. And, and also, also, Volcanic is doing monster damage right now yeah, for everybody. Yeah, I think it's okay. Um... There's also an overflowing one, overflowing chalice in here. But if that's only active on overflowing weeks, we'll never see it. <laughs> that, that was such a dog shit <laughs> effect, dude. That was such a dog shit effect. No, Pete, that's actually such an underrated comment that you just made, but that was such a bad affix whenever it was current, man. I mean, I think it is here. I think this anima power is a callback to that affix. Um, Probably. I also think this is a good anima power, Probably. by the way. Okay, I have, I have a question. So, uh... Is there a place where people can find those screenshots, by the way, for where the locations are? Um, uh, not yet. No, we can put a paste bin together. And okay. I think, link the, it. I think I think Foden posted them in the Titan Forge Discord. Okay. So if you search yeah. things by Foden, but uh, for longevity's sake, yeah, I guess we can I, just I would put together a, a paste I, bin. I can do it after the show. It's all good. And okay. then we'll, yeah. Um,. We'll link it in the description of the show when it comes out and probably in the Discord as well, I guess. So Titan Forge Podcast Discord, best place to go for all things. Um, Dude, they've been uh they've still been slamming Moses and Mythic Plus Moses like weekly. Plus, yeah. 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 Awesome. I, yeah, in fact I think uh I think Anastasia is putting together an event for next time where we're gonna do PTR keys to test out the new ethics. So oh, hell that's yeah. a lot better. Um of these anima powers, I mean a lot of them are are pretty pretty strong too and the fact that it's not rng is actually so it's such a relief um you know it, it does increase the worry that it, things will get boring i guess but it is much nicer than if there's something overpowered that you're just like re-rolling a key until you get um so thank goodness God, for that that'd be awful. yeah um so i guess initial thoughts on this affix my initial thoughts are very positive i think that um it's taking a lot of stuff from Awakened, which was the best affix they've made so far. It's giving us a good carrot for killing these things, and also a stick, but maybe not enough of a carrot and a stick to make it unreasonable to fight these with uh, fight an end boss with chilling presence or whatever. Like that, the time save might still be there. It'll be close. That'll be the kind of thing where it's like you actually have to figure out in specific dungeons if you can gain time by skipping Oros or whatever. My bet the answer is going to be like. Almost definitely not something you have to worry about in most groups, and maybe something you consider in like a really I'm, top end group. There, there's also I, I, I'm very optimistic on this too. I think this is going to be actually this is going to turn out super well. I am concerned a little bit with like some of the flat scaling ones that like you gain five percent crit chance for the remainder of the key versus the ones that like scale with the dungeon level and give you damage over like the, like the volcanic plume one. Like you get, I think you get more damage from is like that the volcanic scaling with key level. I think that scales with key level from what I understand. Oh. Oh no, um, I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think it scales with key level. If if that's the case, that it, that is, I think, bad. Uh, I I thought it was just a proc based on damage number, but if that scales with key level, then yeah, yikes. Um, I want to say I'm not it's 100 sure. I need to constant. 
I need to check on to make 100%. I think it was doing like 16% of someone's damage in a 10, and then I looked at a couple streams and it was doing the same thing at like a 20. I want to say. But I could be wrong. Yeah, I'll have to check on those and the necrotic dagger and stuff. If this becomes a season about some about damage that scales outside of key level or whatever, or the scales with key level, I'm out. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not for that. Uh, if you think yeah. about mechanics where damage is scaled with, with key level, they've been what? Plague borers? Necrotic Wake Weapons, Toldegore Cannons, Siege of Morales Spotters. What do those things have in common? I hate them. Plague Bore is the effect. <laughs> Plague Bore is the oh. effect. Um, so I <laughs> I hope that they don't do that. <laughs> I hope that the damage does, does not scale with you. Junkyard Bots. Junkyard Bots uh, did. Yeah, Shockbot did. Uh, yeah. Right? That yeah. was fucking cooked, too. Yep. So uh, those were dumb, and I hate them. Uh, yep. Agreed. But I don't I actually haven't heard anything about that, so I think Tuttle's. M- m- I'm not sure if that's the case. I mean, it may be made up. Worth don't looking into it. for sure. If it is true, that's something we need to rectify rapidly. Um, but yeah, that's the that's the seasonal ethics. Looks pretty exciting. I'm pretty I'm excited for it. It's 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 got a lot of the good stuff from Awakened, mm-hmm. and it's got some extra things that are different or new, like. For Awakening, the biggest drawback for me was that you couldn't fight them with other packs that existed nearby or take them across the dungeon and fight them with like the second or third boss. But this affix, you can really be creative and it fight too many bosses at once, just like Awaken, or you can fight them with other trash or a random boss. So I'm really down for this. I love that too. I, I think that fighting Reaping with a trash bowl was so fun. Fighting Prideful, where if a single mob gets pulled while you're fighting it, you're wiping, is yeah it's so bad um so i think that the the tuning on this is looking a lot better because if you tune down the affix a little bit then we get to do the affix and the dungeon at the same time instead of having it just be the prideful show which was this season uh, and i think to its detriment agreed i I think that it's cool that you're no longer restricted by 20 percent count intervals i get that's one of our i guess one of our questions that we're going to discuss this week so probably don't want to hammer that too much but yeah uh I think it's cool that it's not, like, super restricting. All right, yeah, let's get to those questions, because there are some good ones. But first, we get to thank our supporters at patreon.com slash titanforge. Uh, they are Paul of U.S. Radmore, uh, Coom Cubine of U.S. Tychondrius. I feel dirty. How the fuck do you name your character that? Why? <laughs> that's that's <laughs> one of those character names that exists until it gets reported by somebody who doesn't like you as well. Coom Cubine? What the <laughs> fuck is that name? <laughs> I can't legally refer to myself as your lawyer, but I'm here to fight for you, Tattles. That's probably related to you getting sued for saying the, uh, the, the F word on broadcast. Um, no Tettles, but in Spanish, which is the same. No is the same word in both English and Spanish, uh, and so is Tettles. Um, Tettles, no. Jaw, Dratnos' Dino Pillow, Chromed, Trekkie, The Marsh Hare, Never Nude, Chewy. Trell is the revolutionary Echo's legit loophole. It's not AMZ, it's AMZ. Moo Tettles, Necris, Tankdil, Nevuk, Sidmora, Evie, now of US Proudmore. Congratulations. Uh, Congratulations. I hope that's a nice server for Frosty K's. Stevenson, <laughs> love the content <laughs> noble bit. Take Light of the Protector and Frenzied Regen off the GCD. No Trick, I scheduled a Tettles Flame. Sire Dematicus. Uh, no Tettles. No Tettles. No Tettles. Powered by Riley. No Tettles. Uh, that was the different no, though. That was the K-N-O-W. Thanks. Drusif. <laughs> Dratnos Routes Abyss. New KSM equals Fort Lovers. Uh, Malding. Tyrannical Dodgers Balding. Mald Champ. <laughs> I'm too much of a boomer to know what I'm way, that too, meant. Dude, I'm way too old to understand that one, too. <laughs> um, M. Sanity. Canyon and Moon Sonara of Emerald Dream Division 7 and Area 52 Scraw. Xena. Rogue is now good enough for prog, but still bad enough to be sat for SLG. Bless up. Red color. Bless up. Some zero of US Tychondrius. YouTube.com slash Workbringer. Morty died three times to mechanics this week. A horror of US Proudmore. KOZ's mythic team is trash cans and not trash cants. Gallic. Snicker Shelby. Alphabet Soup. Druid friends of Evolved Gaming. Roly Polder. Ro- sorry. Roly Poly. Boulder Fist. That's a good tongue twister. Uh, the Laser Chicken, LF 3-Day CE Guild in 9.1. Good luck out there. Uh, Laser Chicken, good spec to be looking for cutting-edge guilds for as well. I think you're, you're going to have some success there. 
Uh, and then Gonzo XD on Zul'jin. Thanks all for the support. And thanks to everybody who changed their name to No Tettles for this week. No Tettles. <laughs> no Tettles. Let's move on to Q&A. First one comes from Nasumi in Discord who asks, Do you think it would be good if any new dungeons have two or more different covenant buffs, and in order to get them, the route changes, and it's up to players to decide if it's worth it to use them? So I guess like, exclu like you either pick the Kyrian buff or the Venthyr buff in a dungeon, and you don't get both uh, in some new dungeon? Hmm, thoughts? I don't know how they would I'm implement a, that. I'm not a fan of Covenant buffs in, like at all, I, personally. I think they're bad, but... I agree, but I think it would probably be better if you went into a dungeon that you, all four Covenants had a different buff for, and you picked the best one, and then if you didn't have that best one, you got a second best one instead, versus right now where you either have the best Covenant for a dungeon, or, or you, you don't, don't have anything at all, all right? Mm. I think raising I the gap between that. those two... You know, it would be better. Um, would it be cool? It would probably be cool in M0, maybe. Maybe you got some special achievement for doing it your Covenant way or something, or you had a quest to... Actually, that would be kind of annoying if people wanted to do it a certain route for their quest and you wanted to do it for yours or something, so maybe that's dumb. Um, I I kind of wish yeah, they I'd could... I'd rather have them have zero Covenant above. Yeah. I'm on that train. I kind of wish they, they had the ability to do this in M0 and not have it come into M+. I think that would be really, uh, really a good way to do this sort of thing. Like necrotic wake with cool and powerful weapons on the ground, awesome gargoyles you can mind control and basically solo the dungeon with, and then they don't work in M plus. Just let them work in M zero. Don't work in M plus. All this cool stuff in M zero with story and for quests or whatever, and then none of it in M plus. That's how I would do it. Uh. Caps in Discord asks, do the Affix mobs interact with Venthyr Lanterns, D Other Side Stuns, or Kyrian Spears? So this is the uh, Tormented mobs. Have you guys asked this? I'm pretty sure, yes, they get hit by the Spears 100% Necrotic Wick. I think they got hit by an urn in a run I saw. And I, I assume they would feed into the Lanterns and Sanguine Depths. So probably everything, yeah. Prideful does, so it, it stands to reason. Some zero in Discord asks, maybe this was mentioned, but to add on to that, what pulls that we don't generally see in pug routes can we think of that are optimal when the 20% increment isn't a factor? Um, uh, for me, I think it's like a lot of necrotic wake. Like that's, that's what comes to mind whenever I think of this is just like necrotic wake is one of those dungeons that you're pulling very heavily around pride right now, especially like the app after the first boss, like more or less is like, very scripted because of like how the 20% prideful timings go. And now you're able to pull even larger and uh, maybe go from like 35 count to 60%. Right. And previously you'd spawn two fucking prides, but now you're able to javelin down and like anima exhaust down like one absolutely massive pull and be able to kind of pull that off in a different way. I do think that there's a new pressure on dungeons, which is that I think they will become skip heavy at the start and do all the trash at the end where you have the four anima powers, right? I think so too. I think that's going to be something I, that there, that this does create pressure towards. Mm -hmm. I think mists especially has some really nasty trash at the beginning. Like you're going to want to skip, skip it all. everything there, honestly, or maybe just yep. do the first pull and then skip the rest. Fuck it all. Like, all, that. All, all that is way harder than the other trash in the dungeon, hands down. Well, well dude, you can... You can even like run straight to the mushrooms and then run like skip past that other. Pa I don't know how you'd skip past it, but you can. There's like, a lieutenant there, right? Uh, that you'd want to oh, do. Oh, where is that fucking lieutenant? Oh god, isn't it here? I can pull it up. I'm looking at it. Yeah, so oh, you'd want to grab no. both the lieutenants before the first boss, right? Oh no, that that first one is in such a bad spot. That's where that trash pack is, isn't uh, it? I I don't know if you have to pull the right pack to pull it. I th Wait, I think... no, 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 that means... Uh, okay, so that first one, A, is at the wall for the mushrooms, and the second one is in the boss room. Yeah. Oh, that's the wall for the mushrooms. Yeah. That... I thought that that was where that... that you thought the uh, O was a circle, where the thing was? Shit. I thought, yeah, I thought yeah. it was where the first... Yeah. That's where the note is. I was like, isn't there There's a, a pack there? Yeah. Oh my god. That would have been that would have been pretty rough. That would be that's a, like the, that's the like under the one. Like columns. Yeah. Oh the Atalus ones. Run. Yeah, where it's just like <laughs> the the affix is cool in theory and then it just takes one good dungeon and makes you pull all the bad mobs in it. Yeah. I don't yeah, think that any of them look like too much like that right now though, which is nice. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, I think a lot of stuff is going to be back on the table that just like, I mean, if you think about Mist, right, the, the, the default strategy for both pug keys and for high keys became kill that first pull, skip the next pull, do the next two pulls, 20% pride into boss. And it's so hard for anything to be better than that with the, tw with the way that prideful works. And that's going to be a lot less true now. I think that it will be best probably to skip as much as you can. But I think we will start to see a divergence between the high key paths where it's like, okay, yeah, we will skip everything at the start. And the kind of more medium key, low key pug routes where it'll just be, let's just pull, you know, the, the packs that are in our way and aren't easy to skip and aren't too hard to do, right? And we'll skip the other ones and, you know, bang. You know what they should do? They should lock, they should lock one of the lieutenants behind a very specific uh, path during the maze. So sometimes you just have to play the final boss with the buff. <laughs> That, they should do that, yeah. They should make it... I mean, but, they should just put all four in the maze and you only ever get one of them, right? Just put them in those mini-boss rooms. <laughs> and and make it so if you get the middle the middle path, you can pull two of them. Yeah, the yeah, wall, yeah. Like the frog. That'd be sweet. I think that's a really good idea, Tettles, and I hope it's not too late for them to make changes um, before the affix comes out. I can't wait for Dratnus' routes to get linked to me pulling three Stoneborn Slashers. <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> Stoneborn slashers. That's the guy those are the guys that are in front of Echelon, the petrified ones. Hmm. <laughs> I may have advocated yeah. that at the start of the expansion. I actually don't remember. Uh, oh wait, I think That's maybe a... my basic route maybe did that or does that. So... Yeah, probably because it was like the... a no skip route. Yeah, the, the no maybe. skips thing. Although those yeah. you can walk through without <laughs> skipping, of course. Um, such a whenever route. you impose a no skip restriction on the dungeons it actually gets pretty rough on a lot of them there's a lot of packs that uh, if you can't skip them like mists for example if you're going in there and you're saying all right we don't have skips like that first part of the dungeon is actually so rough dude even even in like tens now people just fucking invis pot that halls of atonement shit they're they're not playing that yeah they know it's banned i think that's uh that is cool to see going up the ladder or down the ladder okay um, next question. My guild, uh, this one comes from Roly Poly in Discord, who asks, my guild killed Sire and disbanded, basically. So I don't have a cancel council kill, because I had to play my Fire Mage alt there, because our main one quit. And some of my later boss parses are pretty weak on our prog kills. I'm trying to apply for, like, world 500 to 700 guilds, but they aren't taking me. Do I just need to suck it up and join a lower ranked guild, or just keep trying? Um, hmm. All right. So I'll go first while you guys think, because okay. I, I, I actually typed something up to him. Basically, you never, dropping ranks is a bait. Like, you never take a step back in ranks. Um, like, so the patch is kind of in a lull right now, but guilds are still recruiting. Um, no, no guild is going to be full on recruitment because it's not the end of the expansion. There are still people quitting. There are still guilds, like, being formed and dying. I think you continue to apply. And it sucks that your parses aren't as good as they are, but your previous experience and like your previous world rank should be able to be enough to get you into an equitable guild. It may not progress you to where you want to be at the at the very most, like at the very highest rank, but at the same time, you should be able to at least jump back into an equitable guild of where you were before. I think taking a step back is just a good way to get disappointed and be upset. It's tough, because if you're applying to these world 500 to 700 guilds and you have one Sire kill and it's like a, a green parse or whatever... That's the position a lot of people are in after they first kill Sire. And then on farm, they get a good parse, right? And now their profile looks nice. But if you looked at most people's, like, progression kills, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of bad parses on progression. Um, so it is, a, it is definitely unfortunate that you, haven't, that you didn't get the opportunity to update that because these guilds do look at that more than they should. They, more, like, the guilds look at uh, just that, that profile page and see what all the, what all the colors are. Um, yes, yeah, true. And it, you have to get pretty high up before they stop, before they start investigating further. And also, by the time you get up there, they are looking for you know just good progression parses as well. Um, I, just, I mean, I'm just looking. I open up logs, pop open logs, look at Sire P3. I mean, I'm not even like looking at your parse. I'm looking at like Sire P3 damage. I'm looking at your cooldown uses on Stone Legion generals. But like, nobody's do do nobody's that? doing that in a World 700 Guild or whatever, yeah. right? They're they're yeah. looking at that profile page. Uh, and also, I think a lot of them are just like do we need a boomy or not, right? <laughs> they they get an application from a boomy, and they're like, do we need a boomy or not? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's hard to say. Would they, you take a step back ever? Especially when you're... When, like, how, how long do you look wide. before you take a step back? That's, Let's put it that way. Yeah, because, like, you want to raid, right? And the thing about it as well yeah. is that you could, like, 
take a step back, do some farm with a worse guild for a bit, and then get some good parses, and then you had a much strong, you're in a much stronger position applying to other guilds, right? Yeah. Like farm farm Nathria two or three weeks, get get better parses, and uh, all of a sudden the same guilds are maybe much more interested. I don't know. I mean, it's it's a really hard question. It's out of my area of expertise. I haven't had to make this decision before because I kind of I I skip through this level of the of the guilds. So a lot of the times I give advice here, I'm just making stuff up. Um. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for flexing on our on our viewers, Dratnos. You're really <laughs> humble. I'm just saying that, like, I I, I understand the the pressures on you here. Um, I guess uh, looking at your position right now, if you're a Moonkin, I would kind of make the bet that people are going to want Moonkins next year and that you're going to be in hot commodity. You're going to be a hot commodity. So maybe join a guild that even is like slightly worse right now, but keep, keep the, the apps rolling, keep looking for somewhere. I think having somewhere that you're raiding each week, even if it's like not going to be a long-term thing for you is really worthwhile though. Um, so you don't fall out of but, practice. But he's on... He's currently on the realm Boulder Fist. So I haven't that heard would of that realm. Trans- he would have to transfer off of that realm. Okay. That's that realm that fucking Humble was on. They're on. Oh. <laughs> I think Crush Ridge is a, is linked to Boulder Fist, from what I understand. Oh, was it? those are both ogre okay. tribes, right? That makes sense. That's true. That's a deep thought. Um, yeah, I mean, if you don't want to transfer, I, I'd understand. If you don't want to transfer until you found a forever guild, uh, that that also makes sense, I guess. Okay, next question comes from Barefaced, who asks, you guys basically pioneered the great push with the Push Week extravaganza. Will we see another anytime soon for 9.1? Maybe. Probably. I think, I, think, I think these signs point towards yes. I think we have some shit that's in the works. We'll see that. Yeah, we, we want to make sure that we, uh, we iterate on the thing and also that it's, you know, it does something different than the great push as well. So uh, a lot will depend on how much the great push becomes a mainstay too. Uh, but I'm definitely interested in doing something like that again as well. Hopefully in some way where we can pay out some big prizes to, to teams as well. It may not, it may not have to be the most competitive thing. We, there, there's definitely some elements that we may change up with it. We'll, we'll see what we're going to do. We will do we're something. Working on stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We, we got, we got some it. projects in the works, so, uh, stay tuned. <laughs> Anyways, don't stay tuned any longer though, because that is the end of our show this week. So you go somewhere else if you want now. Um, but we'll be back next week on Saturday and then Sundays on the, on the feeds and everything. And that will be the plan until next time. It doesn't work for some reason. Um, thanks for hanging out, everybody. Bye. Later dudes. Bye.